it's highly unlikely that you would ever see these maps in their paper form. They're too far away, too rare, they're too fragile. But with high resolution images delivered on the internet from my online library, you can explore them at will and get to know them intimately. This is the simplest way that maps are given a second life and transformed from private assets to public good by providing access to the information they hold. But in their digital reincarnation, these maps have even more potential. Their information through the images can be unlocked through the use of various software tools and applications and policies resulting in an amplification of the inherent meaning and allowing it to be used across many disciplines. We can see many aspects of the transformation and reuse of historical maps by looking at the journey in my own online collection of this map image of 12 Lobe Gores by Giovanni Cassini. It was made in Rome, printed in Rome in 1790 for a 13 inch globe. And we can see how this has been transformed by digital technology. The image was put online by the Library of Congress Geography and Map Division many years ago. I downloaded the images uh, from the Library of Congress site. Library of Congress, to its great credit, was one of the earliest sites to actually allow free downloading, not just free viewing, but complete downloading of all of their map images and everything else in American memory. They were an inspiration for me to follow the same path. And I experimented with these scores, with geo-referencing them here in ArcMap, scores if you know about map projections, you'll know that the UTM projection is the classic global projection, and I was able to reproject them digitally in UTM, then combine six of them together, one group and six in another group, and then to re-project uh, them in a geographic or unprojected form. Then using ESRI's ArcGlobe software, I was able to wrap the gores into a virtual globe and that you see here. So I've been able to take this 13 inch paper globe that Mr. Cassini would have made in 1790 and now we have a complete digital representation of it. Now that I'm in GIS, I can combine it here with NASA's image of the world at night, which is the modern Earth, and get a real sort of visual and somewhat metaphoric sense of how the Earth has changed over time. So this was very exciting to me, but I was still limited to the desktop, and I wanted a way to distribute this the way I did my historical maps. So fortunately for me, along came Keyhole, the precursor of Google Earth. I was able to create a KML of the globe and share it with Keyhole users. It was still not public. Google Earth then bought Keyhole in 2005, and working with John Hankey and the Google Earth team, I was able to create 16 images of maps in Google Earth and share it with their 250 million Google Earth users worldwide. Finally, but not the end of this chain, I hope, I've placed the globe in Second Life, where I was able to um, make it 100 meters tall. If you know Second Life, everything is gauged and scale by the size of your avatar, and your avatar is roughly two meters. Here we see it in Second Life on my new map island, my map museum. This is my avatar, my new avatar, more spiffy than the one that's in your brochure. Um, flying across Yosemite Valley map from 1883 towards the globe. This is a whole other way now to experience this Cassini globe. My avatar can look at it from the outside and fly into the middle where we have reversed the globe and put it on the inside, and of course, this being Second Life, where you build everything, we built an orrery and a little place to sit. Um, but these are all done in, 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 in multiple prims, it's called, of high resolution. So, you know, my avatar can stick his nose next to that map and really see pretty much everything you might see uh, from the original image. All this prompted me, since I didn't own this map, this was sort of something that was a bit odd for me to do. I, I usually went the other way. You know, I owned the paper, I made it digital. But I found the map in London through a dealer friend of mine. And I bought the globe gores for the terrestrial map and for the celestial. And then I did the same thing with the celestial map. I put the celestial map in Google Earth, and here we see it 
64 million meters outside the Earth, rotating around the Google terrestrial globe. This was before Google Sky launched. I did this last fall. Google Sky launched in the fall. They came to me, they knew of this work, and I gave them this image, and now it's a uh, historical map layer in Google Sky that you can find, and it's really marvelous. It, they, they trends, that's the word, they, if you know astronomy, they took it back to 1790, where the stars would have been, and did their georeferencing that way, and it matched up beautifully. So here it is with the modern constellations overlaid. The only thing that's a little strange about it is it's backwards because this is a God's eye view of the universe. That's how they made the celestial globe. And it's in Italian, which is interesting. Um, and then, of course, uh, put them in to put the celestial globe next, next to the terrestrial in second line. So, this journey of the life and changing use of a map image and its multiple effects shows us how things have evolved in the last 10 years. Maps have become digital, including the old analog maps. They're widely shared, reused, reformatted, and experienced in new ways hardly imagined by the creators. It also reminds us that rich tool sets can reveal more aspects of data sets and data than we might imagine. I'd like to speak now about the evolution of the software tools that I've used in building these online map libraries, which enable users to work with maps in various ways and to pull more information about the maps than, it's available, than it is available by simply looking at them individually. This started with better display and searching software, such as the Luna imaging software that I use, shown here. Allowing, this allows the comparison of multiple maps, the creation of presentations, mashups, saving groups of maps, printing maps, and better searching. We can see here this uh, classic Luna format, the thumbnail view, bringing maps into the image workspace, being able to move them around, look at them in relative size, annotate them, link them to other web pages, zoom in, and make presentations with them as well. This was all built in a Java client. Um, the new version of the Luna software that I'll be putting up on my map site in May takes all of the, almost all of the features of, those, of the Java client and puts it in a browser form, because the browsers evolved so much in the last year that we can do these dynamic things now in the browser. It also adds this uh, faceted browsing, who, what, where, when, and category browsing, all derived from the metadata, which many of you are familiar with. It's, it's a wonderful way to reveal metadata structure. It, it is also highly uh, linkable, everything now in this application can be spidered, not just the individual maps themselves, but all of the facets and all of the combinations uh, that the application itself makes. In addition, you see here the image workspace now in the browser is fully dynamic. Uh, these are maps of Minneapolis, which I just thought would be fun to look at. You can resize the windows, uh, and you can create a URL for the dynamic workspace send it to somebody else, they open it in a whole new browser window, and it opens these same maps, and they're all live. So they can take that mashup, change it, uh, and send it on to somebody else. So this offers lots of interesting possibilities, uh, I think, for people to work with the maps and to actually share those results, use them in courseware uh, in any way that they, that they might like. Here's another example of the workspace. You can also embed it in a blog that has a full embedding feature. And this is the taking the facets now into a category kind of browse where everything is ranked by uh, alphabet instead of by numbers. At the same time that I was expanding the collection in size, I was realizing that serendipity had sort of gone out of the collection when you get over 10,000 images. It's hard for people to just discover things. So we built a whimsical tool based on a stock ticker. It's called the map ticker. And the entire collection goes by in random order in about eight hours. You can do your email. <laughs> you really have to love maps to utilize this tool. But, but we're still good digital librarians. So if you find something that interests you, you mouse over it. You get the brief metadata down below. 
and say you want to look at the Alaska map, you click on it, and it goes into the Luna database, opens the map up, and do all the typical things you'd want to do, zoom in, zoom out, save it, look at the metadata. and so on. 